Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, my name's Donald Clark, so, and uh, I've, my, my actual main interest is the topic which the next speaker is going to be talking about, this guy here, Farak, which is artificial intelligence. That's what I spend all my time. Uh, you know, I'm an uh, entrepreneur business guy by background, so I've built an AI and learning company. I invest in AI. I will only invest in learning companies that have AI in them. I'm sort of slightly obsessed by the topic. If you saw me at the debate last night, you probably realized that. But another interest, which is in a sense related, is blockchain. And you can mention blockchain in a bar, in a pub, and you get weird reactions. Absolutely nobody's ever heard of it, which is the normal one. Some people have heard of it and are slightly intrigued. Some people completely dismiss it. And then you get fanatics who really think it's going to change the world forever. Bigger than the internet is a phrase that's been used around this. But I want to tell you a story about what happened to me on blockchain this year. I, I'm in Berlin, and my family are here, and some friends from Scotland, where I come from, because it's my 60th birthday, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, earlier in the year, in Edinburgh, where I came from, I, I deliberately went along, because I know the people in this project, I got married on blockchain, remarried, okay? So I was married 35 years ago, my wife is here today, my kids, uh, in Edinburgh, and of course, when you get married, you, the government has, gives you a certificate unless you do it in the church and so on. And yet, you don't know where, what happened. Oh, where, did that, where is that certificate? Where is the proof that I was married? I have no idea where it is. It's in some room somewhere. Okay? So I was in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival. I go there every year. And this was the machine I used here. So I had an iPhone on either side. So my wife used this one. I used this one. And I paid to get remarried on blockchain using Bitcoin. It was sort of a weird experience, really. <laughs> but it was actually quite nice, you know, like my lifelong interest has been in technology and learning, and it was quite a sort of personal thing for me anyway. And I thought, wow, the, and I, the reason I tell you this story is that blockchain isn't about Bitcoin. It, it started with Bitcoin, but it's really about trust, and it's really about the concept of where you store those moments of trust. And learning is all about trust. It's all about people doing good things, good teachers, teaching good students, and then you raise their cognitive level. But there has to be a sort of ledger or proof in the real world for employers and others about what they've done, what their competencies are, and how they achieved that. I'll tell you, uh, let me just go on another. Is this working? A private story. These were my kids when they were two years old, twin boys. They're here today. They're 23 years old now. But throughout their lifetime, I took pictures of them with technology on the same sofa in my living room, in the same house I live in. So they're two happy before school. <laughs> All went wrong when they went to school. Okay? And this happened really quickly. These are about eight, nine years old. You know, they started getting these silver boxes. Not only were they getting silver boxes, they were demanding silver boxes from me. And when you have twins, it's twice the cost every birthday, every Christmas. So it started to get a bit wearing after a while. Uh, this is them up about 13 or so. Then they wanted laptops. I don't know if you remember the PC. And these weren't cheap. They weren't cheap at the time. But they wanted this stuff because almost everything they did in learning and homework and so on, they needed one of these machines. Okay, I've got two of them. I had to get them. But that wasn't enough for them, of course, uh, because the Macintosh comes along, you know, like, and they will tell me that they need a Mac. And they will, if you've been a parent, you know how smart kids can be in pressurizing you. Imagine having twins because they plan their pincer movement on you. You know, like, and we used to listen to them behind the door, and they would literally discuss how they were going to fool us into buying things for them. It's a weird thing having twins. This is the next stage. And remember the same sofa here. You notice this is very Scottish. We only have one sofa, one color for all these years. <laughs> uh, but suddenly lots of little things started appearing. Little go games consoles and of course mobile phones came into their life. Big time. And that became a completely different ball game along with tablets and consoles and playstations and Xboxes. So their whole consciousness was involved in this stuff. Okay, and then finally, a iPhones. And iPhones really became the rock solid technology in their life, and the mobile phone still is the rock technology in life. Tablets, interestingly, not. Now, the, the kid on the left didn't go to college, went straight into a startup business, loves it, loves life, loves clubbing, 
isn't interested in sitting in a lecture hall for four years, and I'm glad he didn't go, he's glad he didn't go to college. The other kid was more scientific, uh, sort of, you know, schoolish, and he's doing a degree in artificial intelligence. Okay, so real big contrast between these kids. One's left-handed, one's right-handed, and so on. I tell this story to show how inevitable it is. You know, you have no choice in terms of the way technology will affect young people. It will happen. But Bitcoin came into my life in a really unusual way here because this kid on the right-hand side, and I'm not giving any moral views on this, he, when he was at like 15, 16, smoked weed, okay? I smoked weed when I was that age, so I'm not going to be a moral, you know, I'm not going to give you any moral views on that. It was very interesting. But what I discovered was that he was buying weed. Where do you think he was buying weed? <laughs> he was buying it online. Not only was he buying it online, he had a Bitcoin account as did all of his friends. And they would, go, they would use Tor, which is a browser for going on a dark or deep web, you, know, you see it, and they were ordering drugs online. And it was quite straightforward. It was really straightforward for these kids. My kid was smart, though. He didn't get it delivered to my, uh, my house because he knew I would have gone absolutely apeshit. <laughs> but this is how smart young people are. You never know what technology they're using half the time, but boy, are they using it, okay? So, when these kids go on to Silk Road, actually Silk Road was shut down, which uses blockchain and Bitcoin. When it was shut down, that didn't stop. You can today use Tor, and there's hundreds of small sites where you can not only buy those things, there's a dark side to this as well, because you can buy guns, you can buy all sorts of weird services on there as well. But there's always a dark side to technology, you know. I've never driven a car in my life, okay? But 1.3 million people die horrific deaths every year from car accidents. So don't imagine that this is unusual. Every bit of technology is a downside, uh, but we, in a utilitarian sense, say, oh, I like driving cars. Oh, you know, I'm quite happy if 1.25 million people get ma you know, massacred on the roads as long as I can drive. So on the positive side, let's talk about blockchain and learning and education, okay? So the traditional sort of learning stuff, and we're still living with a sort of client-server model here because most of the LMSs are not really peer-to-peer. -peer. They're really old, kludgy technology. If you've ever had to work with an LMS in that stupid standard SCORM, you'll know that it's really 20 to 25 years out of date and peer-to-peer -peer type networking works. Now, the first big peer-to-peer -peer network was Napster way back in 1999-2000, and... Uh, Unfortunately, it did have a weakness because it had a central point of failure. It still had a directory in the middle. But by and large, this changed the whole music and movie industry forever. This kid who went in his bedroom for three months and changed the world. And he was only 19. Okay, so that did actually happen in our lifetimes. Then this was more interesting to me. I went to a presentation on this way back in the US on Nutella. Because this was completely decentralized, this network. There was no central directory, no central storage of any form whatsoever. And this is still a very dominant form of peer-to-peer -peer transfer. I came back, and this is, my sort of the, this is why I think blockchain really is relevant to learning. I came back, and we had a consultancy project with all the local authorities in England. I'm not from England, but there are many of them. There are 326 little units in government in England. And they all have their own billing systems, and they all do their own thing. And there's huge waste of money. Even in learning, they were all doing their own courses, designing and building their own courses. Isn't that madness? They're not competitive. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you share it? But of course, they're institutions. They have management structures. They don't want to share anything. It's totally and utterly bizarre that in government, we have no sharing. So we built a peer to, we went to the a body above it and said, why don't we build a Nutella-type peer-to-peer network that would allow any individual local authority to create content, and then you just share it with any other authority across England. And we went, wow, that is absolutely amazing. And we reckoned the cost savings were about one and a half billion. It was absolutely huge. So we built it, and we set off doing it. Do you think it worked? No, it didn't. It didn't work because layers of middle management and L&D departments and every one of those little local authorities didn't want it to happen because they wanted to design their own little compliance courses and their own crappy little leadership courses. It's a cottage industry. Education's still a cottage industry, and it's wrong. And that's why it costs so much, <laughs> still. Whether it's schools, 
Universities, it's still a cottage industry. Every teacher thinks they have the right to build their own course and everything, even though it's just 101 physics. It doesn't matter. I'll do it myself. <laughs> There's no other area of human endeavor quite like this. But I think this is why other peer-to-peer -peer things have clearly shown us the way. So we have Skype. Who here has never used Skype? Anybody? Right, okay, so this completely revolutionized the telecoms industry, but it is a peer-to-peer -peer system, and it works beautifully. It completely changed our whole view of what a telephone and communications is globally. You know, my kid studies in another country. We speak to them every week. All my relatives are in Scotland. We speak to them regularly because of this cheap peer-to-peer -peer network. And then in learning, I don't know if you've ever read this book, I highly recommend it because it sort of changes your life almost as it is. It's called Deschooling Society by Illich. And this book is often quoted in relation to, uh, in relation to deschooling and I, uh, schools are bad and it's overplayed a little bit and schools are like religion, it has a priesthood and so on. But the interesting thing in the book is actually the second half that nobody ever reads and nobody ever quotes which is all about a web of learning. In other words, we have teachers, we have learners. How do we sort of get rid of the institutions Recently, Peter Thiel described higher education as the Catholic Church the night before the Reformation started. So you're giving out indulgences or degrees for money, but it's a bit of a con, really, <laughs> you know, all that money being spent in it. And Illich had the same idea. He wanted to deinstitutionalize and democratize education by creating a web, a network of teachers and learners. And that's ridiculously utopian and won't happen, in my view, but it's interesting. So, Coming back to blockchain and Bitcoin, so Bitcoin comes along and I mean, there was a while when a Bitcoin, if you have a Bitcoin now, one Bitcoin, it will be worth about 730 euros, okay? One Bitcoin. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to get a Bitcoin now because you need an immense amount of computing power to mine for it. You get currency, it's a very, very odd concept this, but you actually have to go mining for this stuff as you would mining for gold, but you need an immense amount of computer power to do it. And actually, there are whole groups of people that pull the computers together to get Bitcoins and buy it and so on. But it's a very light gold mining in that sense. And there is a great thing about this, this uh, story here because there's a mystery man right in the middle of it called uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he has a Japanese name, a German email address, but he writes in British spelling and nobody has a damn clue who this guy is, even if he's a guy. Could be a woman, could be a group of people. We have no idea. And several people have been put forward. This poor Japanese guy up on the left-hand side was fingered by Newsweek. They turned up at his door. He was in television. He had nothing to do with it. <laughs> he just happened to have Nakamoto as his second name. And he happened to be a guy who had some good maths behind him. But he certainly was not the guy. The other, uh, uh, the other, the other guys actually are serious cryptocurrency guys. And they may be, but they're not saying. Why do you think they're not saying? Or why do you think uh, Satoshi Nakamoto went to ground because this happened in 2008 when the financial crash came along. Very interesting coincidence that a cryptocurrency of absolutely the same month, September 2008, he went to ground because the CIA and FBI were onto Wikipedia. Julian Assange, who is still imprisoned in my country, shamefully. You know, in other words, the Americans crushed these movements. And do you think the Americans, because they have the dollar as the primary currency standard in the world, do you think they want Bitcoin to succeed? <laughs> Not a chance. This is serious business, and that's why these guys often remain hidden. Okay? Two books I really recommend. One's a really old book, this book on Bitcoin by Dominic Frisbee. Absolutely brilliant read. A real, you can read it on the beach. It's so interesting. But that's one I would highly recommend. The second one's less readable, and it's a typical sort of tap score. It's actually ghostwritten mostly. But an interesting introduction to blockchain. But the basic idea here is the decentralization, disintermediation, democratization of networks down to peer-to-peer -peer, and in an underlying database structure that makes that happen technically. All that trust we can suddenly have in an inviolable environment on a database. So those are the three big words I'm going to focus on, right? So just very quickly, technically, how this works. Two parts. There's a peer-to-peer -peer network. We sort of get the idea there. Skype, all that jazz. Information is created absolutely immediately. So PayPal, PayPal has been so successful because the transactions in PayPal take place absolutely in real time, unlike banking that takes days and days and days. That's why... Peter Thiel made several billion pounds from the thing. But this also happens on a blockchain network, a peer-to-peer -peer network that sits above it. it. 
the information is created absolutely immediately, a really important point in terms of the success of Bitcoin and what we're about to talk. Another important feature is that it's encrypted, private, and you don't know who the person is. There's anonymity. This is really important in financial transactions, but it may also be important, of course, in terms of learning data, in terms of the you know, protection of who the person is going forward. It's decentralized, so there's no single point of failure. Like, if your university suddenly got bombed and you had all your documents in one room that got burnt to the ground and you didn't have adequate backups, you might completely uh, find this absolute point of failure in terms of your data. There is no point of failure in the middle of this network. You know, bits of it, can, other nodes can come off, the rest is protected. The second point is a decentralized database. So you've got this thing, it's called blockchain because you have a block. It always starts with the Genesis block, okay? And then beyond that, once you start doing transactions, and these transactions can be me being married, my son buying drugs, it could be uh, beyond that, of course, Bitcoin transactions, or it could be a learning transaction, a, you know, an apps, a, a learning experience with a competence attached. And then blocks are created, boom, boom, boom. They're promulgated. It's one of the problems with blockchain is actually the complete it's almost ad infinitum a uh, propagation of the blocks and it's sort of excesses in that sense. Nevertheless, every time a new set of transactions take place, they are automatically chained back into all the other blocks and back to the Genesis block. So everything is stored absolutely evenly across the whole network, which means if one goes down, the rest is protected. Okay? That's the, the idea or the signature, the hash that actually does this. That's what blockchain does. Now, coming to learning, I think there are some interesting things happening here on e-portfolios and badges, and we can come to that later. We've got two big things here. That in England, there's a guy called Doug Belshaw and uh, people in Satan Gills who've been working heavily on conceptualizing the notion that badges, which I don't think have really taken off, they've not really taken off because they're not like a currency. They're not like a real degree or a real qualification. But imagine if they did become like Bitcoin like pounds, dollars, euros, then perhaps we have a chance of really giving it the push that it needs, those qualifications that exist below the line, as it were. But I think I, there are 10 main areas here where I think you might want to think, if you're sitting there in the audience, how can I use this blockchain stuff in my institution, in my life, in my company? And let's go through these. The first one is payment and blockchain. Now, that's fairly standard stuff on Bitcoin. I don't think it doesn't happen. There are universities like MIT, University of Nicosia, and other people historically have accepted Bitcoin as payment because it's just another currency. You can go on and exchange your dollars and euros for Bitcoin right now and pay people on that. Now, why would that matter? Well, let's go back to one of my sons. One of my sons studies in Maastricht in Holland, and I live in England. And it's a constant process of sending him money. <laughs> If you've got a kid at college, you'll know that's what you spend most of your communications doing. And this costs me money as well, because if you do it through a bank, they take a fair old whack right off the top. Okay? Now, TransferWise has come along, and they don't use blockchain. These are the ex-PayPal guys, but they massively reduced the cost by using a much more sophisticated form of... Uh, well, it's not blockchain, but it's almost there. But imagine blockchain where there are zero transaction costs where we really can transfer money. Think of those hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students who live abroad and do these transactions all the time. You're not only saving their parents' money, you're saving the students' money, you're saving your institution's money. So I think that's a basic thing in terms of the way this is going. And there isn't a major bank or financial institution in the world who isn't looking at blockchain. And why are they looking at blockchain? Because it will revolutionize their business. It may even put them out of business because they make all their money on the scraping those margins off the top. Okay? Then we can come to an individual institution in blockchain. Okay? So typically an institution might be a school, a university, a company. Okay? And there are several I've just picked. Well, there are really dozens of people doing this now. But if you take Holburton School in San Francisco, why would they use blockchain? Well, one is fake certification. I was in Thailand last year going down Ko, uh, Koh Sam. Anybody been in Bangkok down uh, uh, Koh Sam Road? You can walk down this road and buy almost everything, but there's a great big stall halfway down where you can buy degrees. And they have the one in the window is from the University of Oxford. And you can go in and they'll print you any degree in any subject and it looks damn good. And they'll give you it in a little red box and you can take it home. Now, that shop wouldn't exist if people are not using them, <laughs> okay? In my country, 
Round about Oxford and Cambridge, I did this exercise. We looked at the companies who were writing fake dissertations and essays. We looked at the turnover of all of those companies and tried to work out the number of dissertations and essays that were submitted to those two universities, and it is in the tens of thousands. So the idea that we have a secure system now is a myth. You know, and I know, that in higher education, there are thousands and thousands of students submitting dissertations and essays that they did not write. And you won't catch it on plagiarism software because it's PhD students who are writing them. PhD students who don't have a job very often or on very low wages. So plagiarism is a massive problem here. I think there are other issues around that, never mind. But schools, some universities now are using blockchain to give this complete authenticity to avoid fraud in terms of the certifications that they're providing. MIT is a good example of that, but there are plenty of others. So you can give them a paper copy anyway, but you can also get it in this unhackable database. Okay? Then we've got groups of institutions. I don't know if you saw this brilliant presentation. I think it was last year or the year before, but from Delft University. Anybody from Delft here? I, re I really like this idea. What they had done is teamed up with other universities in a chain around the world, EPFL in Switzerland, Boston, Australia, UBC, and Canada, and so on. And it was a bit like airline code share, and they were all producing MOOCs, and they were looking at the transfer of qualifications for the MOOCs across those universities. It's a big problem transfer, as you know. I was at Penn State University, and somebody was telling me about a guy who tried to get in two years ago. They couldn't actually just get the administration of the transfer worked out in time for him, even though they had applied in summer for October entry. He missed the deadline. He applied a year later, still the same screw up, and he just gave up. And that guy was willing to pay $46,000 a year to go to that college. So the idea that that transfer is working, Bologna was a load of nonsense. It never happened. All talk, no action. So I think we have a chance here of looking at affiliated organizations who use this type of technology to really give a secure underbelly, as it were, to all of these uh, qualifications, whether they be MOOCs or not qualifications within undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. And then nationally, of course, the interesting thing about education in Europe, certainly, and around the world, is it's profoundly national. It's actually a delegated thing in the EU. There is no EU education. It's all delegated off to our individual countries. Even in the United Kingdom, I come from Scotland, we have a completely different education system from England with different qualifications entirely. Profoundly national, but even within a nation, there are big problems in terms of the authentication and management of qualifications because there are more and more of them. In our country, we're going massively into vocational learning. Every employer will be charged 0.5% of their three mil if it's above 3 million turnover on payroll, and that will be paid not for higher education, but for vocational learning and apprenticeships. I think this is an enlightened policy. The Germans did it years ago, but it will be a good thing. But how do you manage the qualifications in that brand new world? It's going to be messy. Blockchain is possibly an answer. On an international level, of course, you could say across the EU we could have, well, not, not us necessarily post-Brexit, of course, that's not going to happen now, but certainly on an international level, you could also look, most students now have an international field. My son went to Holland to study. You know, lots of kids now think that way. But if they do go abroad, they're jumping out of the national system into an international system. But there is no international system in education. It doesn't really exist. It's still a bunch of institutions that have loose agreements between each other. It's, they're all like individual castles, hermetically sealed, not dealing very well with each other. So I think on an international basis, we have underlying blockchain possibilities in terms of the use. Then forget national and international. Let's think a, li a little bit about groups of institutions, because we have groups of privately owned schools, you have Ivy League colleges. Everywhere I go in higher education, I see groups. In England, we have these horrific groups called the Russell Group, who regard themselves as above everybody else in the education system, fueled, of course, by a completely corrupt ranking system, which is a piece of mathematical nonsense because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They ask the principals of those universities where, how they rate the other universities, and of course they rate the universities they went to, which is normally Oxford and Cambridge, and hey, what a surprise, Oxford and Cambridge come right at the top of the rankings. And then they ask about teaching, and they don't use any data because they're mathematically illiterate. They don't use any data, they use proxies, and anybody who's ever been involved in data knows that proxies are not data, so they don't even count the kids who turn up for lectures. <laughs> so they don't have any data, really. 
but they just do these weird ratios, the number of PhD students have got relative to undergraduates and all that rubbish, and come up with the rankings. This is the sort of thing we have to get rid of using really solid technology, a new approach. That's why I think AI also is important here. But groups of institutions perhaps can come together in a way they never have before. Now, I mentioned badges and e-portfolios because I think this is possibly one of the more important ones, along with MOOCs. So, we know that in the learning world, generally in our lives, don't imagine for one minute that school and university and college is even remotely solving the problem of lifelong learning. It does a magnificent job up to a certain age, but most of what we learn in life is learned informally in the workplace from our colleagues, from our family, whatever. So most learning in your lifetime is the orange bit. The formal learning is the little wedge in there. But we think the, bit, <laughs> the wedge is almost everything sometimes. That's the illusion there. And that illusion is carried through. So if you go into corporate training, and I've worked a lot in that area, uh, my good friend, who sadly died uh, two years ago, Jay Cross, who used to come regularly to this conference, wrote a book about this, but it's still true, so that we know that most of what we learn is informal throughout our lifetime, but where does all the money get spent on formal training? Almost every budget in every major company is focused on formal courses, and yet we know with absolute empirical certainty that most people do not learn most of what they learn in those companies through those courses. Millions, millions wasted. And the evidence is really clear. If you want to take just one, take diversity training, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars a year wasted because the empirical evidence from the three major researchers in that area, massive longitudinal trials, show that they don't work. So we're just blindly churning this stuff out. Okay? Now, here we have a solution here, because the informal stuff is a problem. You, nobody's to blame here. How do we measure the informal stuff? That's always been the million-dollar question. How do you measure informal training? All that stuff you do in social media, coming to this conference, which is a real learning experience, I'd imagine. I find it a learning experience, a valuable one. How do we measure that? We don't measure it, by and large, unless we give badges, but there's no serious currency behind badges. So I think we have a possibility of using blockchain to do that especially if it goes into e-portfolios as well. So in vocational learning, which I'm quite passionate about, in other words, learning by doing stuff, I think far too many kids are being churned through the college system. I think it's led to massive unemployment, graduate unemployment. We have a fractured society. In my country, the minority of kids go to university. What happens to the majority of those kids in England and Scotland? They just get dumped. There is nothing for them. And we wonder why people voted Trump in Brexit, because they have more votes than us. <laughs> and they're pissed off. So the, idea, you know, the great danger here is that we keep producing an educational system that produces inequalities, because the majority of kids don't go to university. Remember that in almost every country in the world. The majority of kids don't have that opportunity. And the idea, that, like Schechter said yesterday, that the solution is to send them all to university? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Is that the solution? I was at Penn State University last year. It has its own airport. It has its own airport. It has a football stadium that holds 110,000 people. They only play eight games a year. Okay? The kids live in luxury accommodation in the middle of Pennsylvania. I went a few miles outside of that institution. What do you think Pennsylvania voted in the American election? They voted for Trump. I was in the University of Philadelphia. Exactly the same thing, right in the middle of Philadelphia. I walked three or four blocks in any direction. I saw people, black people, sleeping under bridges while well, these kids were in luxury accommodation, paying $40,000 a year. Do we think that's a sustainable model? It's ridiculous. It's morally bankrupt. Okay, but I think if we look at other opportunities for kids, those 54, 50, 60 percent, then perhaps we have a possibility of looking at e-portfolios and skills and learning by doing it in a way we've never had before. As I said earlier, there are some really good people working on this. So if you look at the EPIC people on assessment, there's a conference held every year. That's a formal organization. I don't know if any of you have looked at that or a member of it with Serge, and the, Serge Revy and his team. They are really looking in anger at the notion of badges being linked to blockchain. And it would be too much to go into detail here because it's an amazingly complicated thing. But you don't have to worry about the complications. Treat it as a black box okay, that will emerge from these groups. Then we have MOOCs, and of course, one of the big problems with MOOCs has been certification. And I'm not a critic of MOOCs. I love MOOCs, I've taken lots of them, and I'm in and out of them all, all the time, and I don't mind dropout. I'm just amazed that millions of people have dropped in 
<laughs> that's, that's the main point for me. You know, I'm not in the slightest bit interested in completing most MOOCs because most MOOCs reflect the university courses I remember, 10-week semester courses, uh, the drip feed. I'm 60 years old. I do not want to wait next week while you as an academic decide to give me your next lecture. I'm not an 18-year-old undergraduate. And the problem with MOOCs, by and large, is they're based on the 18-year-old 18 undergraduate, 18 undergraduate model, and it doesn't cope with the real people in the real world who have kids and jobs and who don't want that model. It's a completely different thing. But we do have a chance in certification of perhaps getting something that really works here. Imagine, of course, Sarah and Udacity. Yeah, I learned something interesting yesterday. How much, you know, people, I remember coming to this conference where whenever you mentioned the word MOOC, people went sort of slightly apeshit and got in a sweat, you know. They'll never work, it's all going to die end of civilization as we know it. How much do you think Udacity is worth? Any guesses? Did it, sorry? Quarter of a million. Quarter of a billion? One billion dollars. And they said it wouldn't work. They said it wouldn't work. Why? Because they went into vocational learning and they avoided doing the more academic stuff because that's where the real market is. But I think all of those people are looking at certification, but they don't have an underlying system of trust with employers, but that will come. And I think Udacity have already solved that problem. They're forging relationships with employers. And I'm not claiming that all education is just about employment and jobs, by the way. Then we have CPD. So I used to be a governor in a, a secondary school in my hometown in Brighton in England for a number of years. And CPD for teachers was a one-day training course when all the kids got sent home and they sit and listen to really boring, outdated psychological theory on crap like learning styles, uh, right and left brain, things that would never help them in the classroom, ever. In fact, most of it was completely made up and fictional. The last one, I actually almost resigned when I saw the mindfulness course coming along and teachers were sitting there meditating. And I went, this is the end. I'm no longer getting involved. This is what real training is for teachers. I'm out of here. Every fad that ever appeared would suddenly be turned into an inset day course. Okay? Real CPD, I think actually by and large for good teachers in England, my country, is actually through Twitter. And we have uh, P uh, some Tom Bennett and others, I think, called Research Ed. 500 teachers turn up every Saturday morning to listen to solid research from good researchers in universities about how people learn. That's what it should be about. But perhaps CPD should be measured in a different fashion, as we've said. And then lastly, knowledge. The whole Wikipedia, the whole creation of content thing, where people put real effort into doing good things, then I think that's another area where blockchain can be applied because those microtransactions, which people actually do on Wikipedia uh, already and in open educational resources, perhaps could be opened up by a system that really does authenticate privately all those mini transactions, which is what blockchain will do for financial people. Okay? So that's 10 things that you can think about. I've only had 30 minutes, so I can go into any of them in detail. One thing I would recommend, though, is this thing. This is, the students are actually doing it for themselves. So look at the Ben network, because the, ben, uh, the blockchain education network isn't academics doing this. There's loads of good academic research done on blockchain. Loads of universities are doing wonderful stuff on that. But this is a bunch of students who got together who want to use this stuff in anger. Listen to what these guys are saying, because as I said, my son was using this three years ago. I didn't know about it, but you should be listening to what these kids have to say about this stuff as well, because there are some great opportunities. So, you know, education's a bit of a slow learner when it comes to technology. I think that's okay. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of relaxed with that over the years, because you shouldn't be just shoving stuff, tablets and stuff into classrooms and lecture halls willy-nilly. But here we have a real opportunity of doing something that really is sort of changing in the underbelly of the system, whether it's national or internationally. I think Bologna was dead in the day it was signed. Uh, the funding, unfortunately, doesn't lend itself to this because it's all institutional. But I think we have a possibility of seeing this thing because it came from left to field. All the great technology in my life has always come from nowhere, like an asteroid from space, whether it be mobile, texting, Skype, Automatic cars, who saw that one coming? Self-driving cars? Amazing things happen here, and I think that could be true of Bitcoin as well. Okay, I'll end on that. Slightly positive, pessimistic as well. But if you've got any questions about how you might want to apply Bitcoin, I'm involved in some of those projects myself, and I'd be happy to share that knowledge with you. But thank you very much for listening. How much time do we have? Do we have any time for questions? All right, no, we don't have any time for questions then. Thanks very much for listening anyway. Thanks for coming along. Thank you.